So this is where we've been at, you guys. Are we recording? Yeah. Okay. We've been talking about being in, in His image, about God uh, continually uh, revealing to us His plan for our lives. That we would get back what we lost in the garden. Remember we've been talking about that? Yeah. And we've been talking in the context of what we're trying to do as a church. And so we have three different things that we're trying to do. The reading plan, which you got Isaiah 53 out of, out of the way this morning. So you don't have to read that today. Um, so you just have two chapters for your Sunday reading today. Although you could read it again. Uh, that was pretty good. Um, it's a pretty good chapter. One of the most famous chapters in all of the Bible. Um, maybe the most stunning prophecy in all of the Bible. Um, it's just amazing what God has done through Jesus. And so we talked about the word, and we talked about relationships, that God would be writing our relationships with people, that we're supposed to have authentic relationships with other believers and, and, a, that, and an authentic relationship with God, that our vertical relationship would get right with him, and then our horizontal relationships would get right with the rest of us. Amen? And then we talked um, about serving, about pouring our life out as a drink offering for the Lord last week. And, um, well, that was two weeks ago, actually. And then last week, we just, got, we just got crazy talking about victory, that we're supposed to be walking in this victory that God has for us. And um, If you didn't hear that sermon last week, I don't often like tell you to go back and listen to one, but if you weren't here last week, like you need to go back and listen to that sermon on YouTube and just get it in your spirit, uh, that, that, that victory. Because <laughs> that's just going to, I think that's just going to carry us through the rest of the year, honestly. Um, just that attitude of walking in a victorious life in Jesus Christ. And so um, you go back and listen to that if you didn't hear it. But uh, we've been looking at a couple of different scriptures. Uh, but first, before that, I'm going to talk about uh, Habitat. Um, every time we build a Habitat house this last year, uh, Craig could tell you, uh, when we build a Habitat house, there's, a, uh, there's something that we have to do uh, before you even start to build. Uh, we get this thing... Uh, you want to go to the next slide for me? Anyone tell me what that is? That's a blueprint, yeah. So you have to have some kind of blueprint. You have to have something to go off of when you're building a house. Um, that's not obviously not a Habitat house. Um, that's just a picture I found on Google. Uh, but, <clears throat> but the last two Habitat houses were built from scratch. And uh, we had nothing in the beginning but just a hole in the ground where the house used to be. Uh, we tore down two different houses to build new ones because they just weren't salvageable. And so when you're building from scratch, you, you, have to, you just have a set of blueprints from the architect. That's it. The task is to take those blueprints and create in reality what was in the mind of the architect. That's our task with Habitat. And you had to have the blueprints on site at all times. We weren't allowed to not have them on site, although we didn't do the best at that, did we, Craig? Uh, but uh, we figured it out eventually, and... Um, and yeah, ultimately you end up with the house. Uh, if you followed it correctly, you end up with the house that the architect intended. You ever bought anything from Ikea? Or like a cheap desk from Walmart? Yeah? And you get those instructions. And it's like you get something from Ikea and now I have to like, I have to look at these pictures that some guy in Sweden drew for me uh, to try to create what he had in mind when he made that, those directions. So my goal is to create into reality what was written down on paper for me. I like Ikea directions, by the way, no words. That's my favorite. I don't have to read at all. It's just like putting Legos together. It's a glorious thing. Uh, the Walmart desks, not so much. I always end up with like seven extra pieces after I build a Walmart desk. <laughs> <clears throat> And you read on the box, we are not liable for your computer <laughs> uh, They created it. They gave me the materials. A lot of times they give you the tools. But you have to walk it out. You have to use your talent. You have to use the brain that God gave you. You have to use the hands that God gave you to bring this thing into reality. And the same is true in the kingdom, isn't it? I mean, God has given us this blueprint. That's what we've been looking at over the last few weeks. That's what we look at every Sunday. God's given us this blueprint to live by. 
He's given us his vision for the church. He's shown us how it's supposed to be done. And our goal is to take that blueprint right here and to walk it out and build into reality what God had in mind. Does that make sense with you this morning? Okay. This thing's going to drive me crazy today. So the same goes for God. He's given us this mandate, this mission to go to, through all the earth and make disciples. And so let's take a closer look at those prints today and see what we might build. You with me? Okay, let's go to the next one there. Genesis 1, this is where we started at each part in this series. Genesis 1, 26 says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let him, them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, and over the over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. How many of you are glad we have dominion over the creeping things that creep on the earth? Yeah, I saw a spider back there this morning. I dominated that thing. It had no chance against me. <clears throat> so God created them in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And so we're made for dominion. We were made to, to rule this earth. We were made to be good stewards of everything that we see around us. That's the first one. Next one. This is the other scripture we were walking through. Um, this was after, uh, bless you, this was after uh, Jesus had asked his disciples, who do the people say that I am? They said, well, some say John the Baptist, some say uh, Jeremiah, some say John the Baptist. Uh, but we, s and then Jesus said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. That's what we see there on the screen. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for, bless, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not be prevail against it. I, give you, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And uh, last week we talked about I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. We talked about that victory, that we are on offense, that we are on the attack as the church, that the gates of hell cannot withstand our attack. If we just follow what Jesus has in mind for us, we cannot lose. We cannot lose. That's the truth of the word. And yet, uh, verse 19 is even harder <laughs> to walk out in a real... And just, just think about uh, what that actually means. I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. And whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And this verse just confuses me, honestly. Like, this is one of the most mind-bending things. Because when we read that, a lot of times we think, like, we are actually affecting, like, our actions affect heaven. Like, we're, we're going to change God's plan. Do you think that's what it means? I don't think so either, no. But that's what it kind of looks like, doesn't it? I mean, when you read that first glance, we have to really dig into the syntax this verse and to get into the details of it, and we will. Um, but I just wanted you to, to see that. Sorry. So uh, God has given us this mandate that whatever we bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever we loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. And we don't really talk like that, do we, normally, now? Well, in Jesus' day, they talked like that all the time. They would have known exactly what Jesus was talking about uh, because the, the whole pharisaical system, the whole system of the rabbis and the teachers in the Old Testament uh, was, all, was all based around this, was all based around binding and loosing. Uh, they would have known exactly what Jesus was talking about. And so binding and loosening in the historical sense, you know, you take all these commands of God, even the Ten Commandments, and they seem so black and white, don't they? Like, it, like we say, thou shalt not murder. Like that feels pretty black and white, doesn't it? Uh, it's not. It's not. There's a multitude of interpretations for just that. Thou shalt not murder. And we say, well, I haven't killed anybody. Well, what if someone walks into your house and intends to rape your wife and children? Then what? Is it okay to defend yourself? 
What if you get drafted into the war and you have to go overseas and you're fighting an enemy who hates God? Is it okay to kill someone? And we have these different things in our society. We talk about abortion. What about capital punishment? You know, I know you're not the one injecting someone to kill them. But what if you're the one who voted for the person who made the law that it's okay? And where do we draw the line? And so it becomes pretty gray, doesn't it? We start to wonder and we start to think, okay, what's okay, what's not okay? And where's the line of thou shalt not murder? Where does that start and where does it stop? And that's not the point of this sermon is to go through all those things. I, I could, and I'd be happy to if you want to, you know, if, if I just bothered you <laughs> with my interpretation of it, I'd be happy to sit down with you and go through my interpretation of it. But after all these commands were laid out, now the Israelites are starting to try to walk out all these different commands that God has given them. And so the rabbis and the Pharisees, they were the ones who made the decision to bind meant that it was not okay. It was not good according to the law. And to loose meant it was okay. It was lawful to do that thing. And so they would draw the line somewhere and say, we are binding it here. This is where it's not okay on this side. And on this side, we loose everything else. That makes sense? Okay. And so they did that for things like, uh, for things like thou shalt not kill. Um, they did that for things... And obviously they were okay with capital punishment. We read the Old Testament, those kinds of things. We see all the different, different ways that they laid out that capital punishment was okay in their society. Um, and then the Sabbath, like keep the Sabbath holy. Yeah, that seems pretty cut and dried, that we're supposed to take, take a Sabbath, that we're supposed to take a day of rest. But where does that stop? You know, what are you allowed to do on the Sabbath? What are you not allowed to do? And so they made all different kinds of rules. And they had actually a thing called a Sabbath walk or Sabbath journey. And so they had, I think it was something like 500 cubits or something. There, were, there, was, a, there was a journey that you were allowed to walk so far and no further. If you walked any further than the Sabbath journey, now all of a sudden you were out of the law and you were in sin. Or you were allowed to bake the day before and you were allowed to make the fire. You were allowed to prepare the day before and maybe you were allowed to make a fire uh, and you're allowed to cook, but you weren't allowed to prepare your food. You just, just, just cook it. So you could make the bread the day before, but then you could bake it the day up. And they would make all these different laws of what was okay and what was not okay. And that's what the Pharisees, that was their job. That was their job. And so when Jesus says this, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loose in heaven, he's giving us the power to interpret properly what these laws are supposed to mean. He put that power into the church. He gave it to us. There's risk in that, isn't there? Great risk in that. Because we see what the church has done with it a lot of times. You, know, you look at the dark ages and you look at some of the things that the Catholic church did to people. It's horrifying. It's embarrassing to be a part of it. The way that they tortured people. That's what always gets thrown in your face, isn't it, as a Christian? You start talking to someone about Jesus, and then it's like, oh, well, what about, what about this? What about when this person did this in the name of Jesus? What about what this person did in the name of Jesus? And so we have to have some kind of system to, to get that back. Jesus has given us the keys. He's given us the keys. Let's look a little bit further. The Pharisees got this all out of sorts, didn't they? I mean, we look in Jesus' day, they had it all messed up. We see Jesus correcting these things throughout his entire ministry. He was binding and loosing all the time, even though he didn't use that terminology. But they knew exactly what Jesus was doing. He was overriding the Pharisees' binding and loosing and bringing in a proper binding and loosing that was from heaven. That was through the Spirit. Am I with you? I know this is kind of confusing sometimes. So I've talked about this before. In our context, I've talked about the letter of the law and the spirit of the law. You remember when we had those conversations? And so a lot of times you might be saying, well, I always, I always drive the speed limit. I, I drive to the letter of the law. But when someone cuts you off, you like swerve at their car. Yeah, anyone do that? Like, you're like, oh, I'm just gonna get, like he's trying to pass you and you like get over in front of him so you make sure he doesn't speed and you almost kill your family and the family in the other car. So you're following the letter of the law, aren't you? You're going the speed limit. You're doing, you're doing what the sign told you to do. 
But the spirit of the speed limit, the spirit of the law of the speed limit is safety, right? And so when you're doing those things, you have road rage because everyone else around you is driving faster than that. You're not following the spirit of the law. You're just following the letter of the law. And I would argue that you're in more sin than if you were speeding. Like I'd rather go 60 and be happy than go 55 and be an angry mess. Following the spirit of the law is more, more important than following the letter of the law. Both important, but the spirit of the law is more important. Our flesh desires to boast in the, our obedience to the letter of the law. That's what we want to do. Like if I took my Sabbath every week faithfully, the Pharisees love to do that. And they would say, I took, or I did my tithe. And they would go and tithe. They'd grow all these spices in their garden, and they would measure them out and find out. I have nine, 10 ounces of thyme, and so I take one ounce of thyme and bring it to the temple, and I tithe down to my very spices. That's what they did so that they could boast that they were following the letter of the law, the tithe. But Jesus came, and he kind of blew all that stuff up. He said, well, you haven't killed anyone? Great. How about anger? What's your anger look like? Jesus said, if you've ever been angry with someone, it's just the same as murder. And so he bound. He bound anger. He took it beyond even the letter of the commandment, thou shalt not kill, and he took it all the way to anger. He was binding. He did the same thing with lust. Do you remember that? He said, so you haven't committed adultery. Congratulations. Congratulations. You ever looked on a woman with lust? You ever looked on a man with lust? It's the same thing. You've committed adultery in your heart. He bound lust. He did the same thing with divorce. They were just, they'd go to the Pharisees and say, I want to get a divorce. They'd say, great, here you go. Pay your money. Here's your certificate. Go, go give this to your wife. You're good. Jesus said, no. It's a command between a man and a woman. There's a covenant there. He said, it's not supposed to be that simple. It's not supposed to be that easy. It's not supposed to be that flippant like we make divorce in our nation. Now, there are instances, of course. Even Jesus gave instances where divorce is okay. But it wasn't supposed to be the way that they were doing it. They were doing it. They were doing it wrong, and so he bound. He bound. And in other things, he loosed. The Sabbath. Remember all the times that they came up to him and he would heal someone and they would say, Jesus, it's the Sabbath. You can't do that. That's work. How ridiculous. How ridiculous. And Jesus said, well, of course it's okay to help people on the Sabbath. Of course it's okay to heal people on the Sabbath. If your sheep was stuck in a hole, you're not going to leave him there until Sunday morning. You're going to get him on Saturday so he doesn't die. Don't be so ridiculous with it. Stoning, you remember stoning for adultery? Remember the woman who was about to be stoned by the Pharisees just as an example to Jesus? And Jesus said what? He that's without sin cast the first stone. And so he loosed there, right? He loosed us into forgiveness. He loosed us into grace to give people, truly repentant people, another chance. He was loosing in that situation. Retaliation, you know, the Old Testament, eye for an eye. They did something to me, I'm going to do something back. Well, Jesus freed us from that. He freed us to forgive. He said, someone hits you on the cheek, give them the other cheek. Someone takes your, uh, someone takes your cloak, give them your shirt too. Someone wants you to carry your stuff a mile, carry it two miles. You don't have to retaliate. You don't have to be angry about it. He set us free from that. How awesome. And so Jesus was binding and loosing all the time. He was doing it all the time. We just didn't talk about it like that. All right, this is the next one. <clears throat> Same terminology here. Matthew 18, 15. If your brother sins against you, go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. If he listens to you, you have gained your brother. But if he does not listen, take one or two others along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If he refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if he refuses to listen even to the church, let it be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. That's not a good thing, by the way. To be a Gentile and a tax collector would mean we don't hang out with you anymore. Okay? 
Truly I say to you, whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. There it is again. Again I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. And this is how the English Standard uh, translates it. You'll see a lot of different translations about that binding and loosing. Uh, but the proper, the proper translation, when you look at the tenses and all the different things, and so it'll say, and it's kind of confusing to say it this way, but it'll make more sense, hopefully. Whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth shall have been bound in heaven. And so what it's saying is, like, this blueprint idea. God made this blueprint idea, and when we're following the Spirit in our actions, in our binding and our loosing, when we're following what Jesus wants us to follow, like, we are actually just bringing into reality what God has already planned in heaven. Whatever we bind on earth shall have already been bound in heaven, and we're just now bringing it into reality, bringing the church into the reality that God had originally planned it to. Make sense? You with me? Okay, let's look at a couple. Well, this one is for relationships, right? And so if there's someone among us that's like openly in adultery or openly in whatever, like they're not in the, they're not in the kingdom. They're not in the church. And so Jesus says, when you kick them out, <laughs> when you say, hey, that's, that can't be here, like you can't be openly like adulterous <laughs> in this place, like you can't bring in your girlfriend while your wife's sitting next to you, like that's not a thing, uh, it's okay to get them out of here. Because they're not part of this. They're not following at all what God wants them to do. And so we're just taking that heavenly reality that they're not part of the church and we're bringing that heavenly reality down here and making them not part of the church. Now they can repent. They can come back. Like we're, I'm open to all that. But if they're not part of the church there, then, then I don't know. Should they be part of the church here? I know we're all works in progress. I'm not saying that this is like a place for perfect people or anything like that. I'm just saying, like, if you're here, you got to want to be better. You can't be, like, in open rebellion against God. Like, that's not a thing. Okay? Next one. John 20. On that evening, the first day of the week, the doors being locked and the disciples were in fear of the Jews. Jesus came and stood among them, and he said to them, Peace be with you. This is after Jesus died, okay? He's resurrected. He comes back, and he visits the disciples. And he shows up just like instantly and says, peace be with you. I would need him to say that to me if that was that in my situation, right? Like if he just popped right next to me, I would need him to calm me a bit. Uh, when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, receive the Holy Spirit if you forgive at sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you withhold forgiveness from any, it is withheld. That's hard, isn't it? Like what a power that he's given us. But notice what had to happen before he would give us that power. Immediately before, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. Now you have the power. Because in our flesh, we would do all kinds of crazy things, wouldn't we? We would withhold forgiveness from people. We would do all kinds of stuff that wouldn't be biblical at all. But with the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Spirit, we can take this book and take the plan that God had in heaven and bring it into reality on earth. Make sense? With the Holy Spirit. You have to have the Holy Spirit for any of these things to be true. Let's go to the next one. Acts 15, chapter 1, or Acts 15, verse 1. But some of the men came from Judea and were teaching their brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders to ask them about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversion of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. And so Paul and Barnabas are out on this journey. They're going to all of these people who have never heard of Jesus Christ before. And the Holy Spirit is just doing amazing things. They're starting churches everywhere they go. People are getting saved. People are getting changed. They're getting delivered and freed from all of the things that have been in their life. And then these Jews come. These Jews come and say, okay, all you guys, if you haven't been circumcised, you're not in the kingdom. None of this other stuff matters. If you're not circumcised, you can't be part of the kingdom. 
and Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them. And if you've read any of Paul's writings, you can imagine what kind of dissension was there. <laughs> Paul was not a calm man when it came to bad doctrine. He was very strong in his words. So strong that they uh, had to appeal to the uh, Supreme Court, so to speak, and send him back to Jerusalem to get the proper interpretation, to get the proper binding and the proper loosing. You see where we're at here? Next one. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by the mouth of the Gentiles should you hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you going to put God to the test by placing the yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear. But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. And so Peter gets up and gives this speech, and he says, they gave them the Spirit, God gave them the Spirit just the same as he gave us. It didn't matter if they were circumcised or not. He gave them the Spirit, and they were saved, they were changed, they were delivered just the same as we were. And so why would we test God by putting something else on them other than, than this salvation that comes only by grace? Why would we test God by putting another rule, by binding them in this way? Next one. Verse 20. This was after, I think, I think this was James that said this. We should write them to abstain from, these thing, from the things polluted by idols and to stay away from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For the, from the ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he, is, for he is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. And so they say, it's not the outward appearance, but there are these inward things that we know that people struggle with. In their, in their time, it would have been things from, you know, things that were offered up to idols. You, know, you wouldn't take things that were offered up from idols. You wouldn't be involved in sexual immorality. That was a huge problem in the Roman Empire. So they said, stay away from that. Stay away from things that are strangled, things that are blood. There was all these, these things that were, that were more uh, inward attitudes than the outward appearance. And so they were binding and loosing even in that time, <laughs> even in the early church, addressing the individual sins of the, of the different areas. Make sense? Okay. Uh, next one. Yeah. So Jesus has given us this amazing this gospel to proclaim. And so what an incredible freedom that we have. Truly, we're free from the law, we're free from our sin, we're free from the power of death. And what gifts have we received? The word, the church, the Holy Spirit, a purpose. It's a gift to have a purpose. The spirit of the law is revealed when we're changed. It's the evidence that you've actually received salvation. That the Ten Commandments aren't the standard anymore. We're talking about the standard is now absolute perfection in Jesus. That the Spirit lives out in us and continues to mold us into. It's no longer this losing battle against sin, like me trying to just fight all the sin in my life and trying to beat it back any way that I can. Now it's God inside of me, walking with me, hand in hand, leading me into victory. I see this, Jesus' prayer this week. Um, <laughs> Jesus says, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we've also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I think it's really interesting, and in Jesus' model prayer for us, first he just proclaims God's greatness, right? God, you are great, holy is your name. The very next thing after proclaiming God's greatness is this, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It's exactly what we're talking about. This binding and loosing. This taking the blueprint that God has given us and bringing it into reality, praying it into reality in our surroundings. How awesome. How awesome. He told us to do that. But I bet when we say those words, we don't think that. 
if you're anything like me, I was raised Catholic, and we said that prayer every day, every single day. And as a little child, I can remember it had no meaning. It was just words that I'd memorized. But to really take that and get it into our spirit, God, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as is in heaven. Like everywhere I walk today, I want to see your kingdom brought from there to here. If we'd really start to pray that way, if we'd really start to act that way, if we'd really start to walk that way, what an amazing difference we would make. Okay, five things that can keep you from God, then we'll be done. Or that can, keep us, that can make us lose. We're supposed to win, right? Yeah. Five things that can make us lose real quick. These are just a bunch of D words that God gave me this week, so I figured I'd go to it. You have to keep going. We get distracted. That's the first one. I'm prone to this. We can get distracted really easy. Social media is a wonderful tool. Uh, the TV can be a wonderful tool but it can also be a horrible, horrible distraction from the mission that God has called us to. Go to the next one. We get discouraged. As we talked about this last week. Mindset is so much. And we can become discouraged and we can think, well, even though we're on offense, the world is too strong and we can't win. Or we can say, well, the church is just in this onslaught from the world, and so we're just going to go into a defensive position and just pray that we can hold on somehow till the end. That's the wrong mindset. It's discouraging sometimes because we see the things that, happen, that are happening in this world. But we have to realize that the things that we see and the outward appearance are not what God sees in the spirit. We are walking out a different reality than what we see in the world around us. We are walking out this reality of victory. And so we have to have our mindset and not be discouraged, but be encouraged. Because the blueprint says that we win. The blueprint says that we win. So we need to follow the blueprint. Next one. <clears throat> we get distorted. And so we see the Pharisees, and they, they had this power to bind and loose in their society. And so they started to do things out of the flesh instead of out of the spirit. And when we start to do that, we start to get things distorted. When we start to bind things that Jesus has not bound, and we start to loose things that Jesus has not loosed, we're no longer walking out the blueprint that God had in mind for us. We're walking out our own thing. We're getting distorted by the enemy. We're getting distorted by the world around us. We need to be clear. That's why we're reading this thing every single day. That's what the challenge is for us, to get this so deep into our spirit that we can't walk out any other reality. Amen? Next one. We get divided. The enemy would love to do this, right? He loves to divide people. He wants to divide you from your spouse. He wants to divide you from your kids. He wants to divide us from each other. We want planned divisions in this church because we want our small groups to grow. We want things to multiply. We want the believers to multiply. And so division can be a healthy thing, but the enemy would like us to be divided with different mindsets, with different goals, with different blueprints in hand. Because if you have two different builders building off of two different blueprints, uh, one side of the house starts to look wrong, different from the other, and all of a sudden things are all wonky and you got to tear it down and start over. We don't want that. I've started over enough times in my life. I don't know about you. Like every time I do a project at my house, I feel like I have to do it twice. I do it and start up. You ever did that with a door frame, Luke? Three times yesterday? <laughs> start it, tear it down, start it, tear it down, start it, tear it. Now all of a sudden, okay, now we're on the same page. Now we got it right. Now we got the angles right. Now let's get this thing done. I don't like to work like that. It's not fun. Sometimes it's the reality of what we have to do. But we don't need to do that. <laughs> Last one. <laughs> We get deceived. And this is what we've been talking about, identity. And so if the enemy can convince us that we're someone that we're not, if he can convince us that we're not a victorious person, that we're not a child of God, that we're not supposed to walk this thing out, he can win. And we can lose. So don't be deceived, brothers and sisters. Don't be deceived. You're made for victory. You're made to win. You with me? I don't remember what the last slide is. Show me. There's a few more things, I think. Oh, yeah, the blueprint. Yeah, go ahead. Just three, more, four more times. One, two, yeah, that's it. Okay. So this is the things we have to ask ourselves when we have this blueprint. Before you're going to build a house, before you're going to build your uh, desk from Ikea or whatever it is, you have to ask yourself, do I have all the materials? You look through the box. Remember, you do that. Set, to set aside everything in the box. You make sure everything's in here, all the screws and all the bolts, all the little tools, all those things are there, all the materials are there. Then I look through and I say, do I have all the tools? 
Did they give me the right little Allen wrench? Did I, do I need a drill? Do I need, what do I need for these things? And lastly, do I have the talent? Can I complete this thing? Can I do it? And when we look at this house that God wants to build, we look at this church that God wants to build according to this book, I look and I say, yeah, we have all the material that we need right here. All the material we need right here. Doesn't take money, doesn't take buildings, doesn't take any of that stuff. The first century church had none of those things. And they built the church better than you or I could ever possibly imagine. Because they had this, the material, and they had the tools. What's the tool? What's the power that gets this thing done? The Holy Spirit. And so if you have this, and you have the Holy Spirit, the talent don't matter anymore. <laughs> you don't have to be some special person. We look at Peter. Did Peter have a lot of seminary training? Yeah. He caught a few fish. Well, not too many according to the word, but he called himself a fisherman. Matthew knew how to collect taxes real well. Paul knew how to bind and loose in a pharisaical way. He knew how to hang, people, hang things over people's heads. He knew how to chase down Christians and make sure they were killed. Doesn't sound like church plan or training to me. But God did it. Because they had the tools, they had the material, they had everything that they needed. So you don't matter in this thing. Your talent doesn't matter in this thing. I shouldn't say you don't matter, because you do. But you just got to participate. You just got to walk this thing out. That's it. So let's walk forward in victory. Amen? Let's pray. God, I pray that this would be our reality for each and every one of us. Lord, that you would continue to, to make us into who you want us to be. God, I pray specifically for interactions this week for, with, between us and other believers. God, I want you to challenge us. And when we interact with someone and we hear of a situation that is so negative or hear of a situation that is just not of your will and we know it, that we would be brave and we would be bold to speak your life and to speak your truth into every situation we see. God, we don't want to become like the Pharisees and hang rules over people's heads or do any of those kinds of things, but we want to bring people into the reality of the freedom that we felt this morning in our worship. We want to bring people into the reality that things can be joyous, that not everything has to be so dark and dreary as our world proclaims it to be. That not everything has to feel so hopeless, that not everything has to feel so unpeaceful. But God, that you could change it all. God, help us to move forward from this place with a warrior's mindset. God, that we would know that you're fighting with us side by side, that you're walking with us step by step. Help us to live a victorious life this week. Not for our own glory, not for our own kingdom, but for your glory and for your kingdom, for the salvation of the people of this city. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.